Okay. Everyone sees this moving around? Okay. Cool. Well, thanks for coming this morning. Um, I my name is Michael Kalshaw Mauer. I'm a third year in the graduate group in ecology. Um, I put together a little talk on some cool tools and some stuff I've been thinking about in R a little bit lately, and sort of um, some pitfalls that I think we might get along the way to making our code faster. So I, you know, sticking with the uh, theme of corny talks with R or something in the title. Uh, I titled it, Avoid the Root of All Evil, Premature Optimization. So first thing is to imagine a little scenario. Um, so OK, you, your script, whatever you're working on, takes 30 minutes to run, right? Maybe you're doing some simulations, whatever you're working on, takes 30 minutes. You can only go get coffee so many times in the day, and you're just really getting sick of it. So you remember, ah, someone once told me for loops are really slow. So you're like, okay, you get down to work, you take a half day, you get rid of all your for loops, you're feeling good. Now your script takes 29 minutes and 55 seconds to run. Uh, and you fling your coffee at the wall of your office and you know, drop to your knees and yell at the skies in frustration. Uh, I would say that there's sort of an equivalent scenario. Your bike feels really sluggish on your way to work. You're coming in and you're coming onto campus, bike feels really slow. And you remember, ah, someone told me carbon components make your bike lighter, and that'll make my bike faster. So you spend a lot of money and you buy some expensive carbon components, and your bike still feels slow. And it turns out your brake pads have been rubbing on your wheels the whole time. So some wisdom from Donald Knuth, the uh, creator of tech and a general computer science titan. So this is kind of the classic line to be given at this point, which is that the real problem is that programmers have spent far too much time worrying about efficiency in the wrong places and at the wrong times. Premature optimization is the root of all evil, or at least most of it, in programming. So a lot of us probably don't consider ourselves programmers, but I think a lot of us still share some goals with programmers and that we don't want our, our, our code to run for a very long time. So we decide to um, try to optimize things. So I'm going to kind of talk about the ground I'm going to cover today. Uh, there are many topics to cover. Like, there's so many different ways we can talk about optimizing code. Um, and I'm going to go for breadth, not depth. So you can look up a million tutorials on, on how to use apply functions. There have been better drug talks in the past that you can go look at and watch on vectorization and apply functions and stuff like that. So I'm just trying to sort of introduce you to a bunch of different tools that I discovered, um, many, of, many of which I discovered in the course of putting this talk together. So I'm going to try to arm you with some tools to optimize strategically, right? So the bike example, uh, you, knew, you knew about some different tools you had, right? You knew about some different things you could do to make your bike faster, but you didn't have the idea of how to pick which tool to use and when it was appropriate. So I'll also hit some low-hanging fruit that apply across different contexts. So a couple things that you might consider changing that could, could speed up code more generally. Um, and just remember, R is really broad and flexible, so it's my way or one of a hundred other highways. So there's no need to take anything I say here as the uh, uh, be all end all. Also, lots of puns, so be ready for that. All right. So first thing we want to do in any problem like this, the thing that we skipped in the bike example, is getting the lay of the land. So the first thing we want to do is figure out our optimization targets. Like, what is making our code slow? What are we doing that's actually making it slow? R actually has a built-in feature for this called RProf. So this is R profiling. Um, however, uh, it is evil. It's not actually evil. It's just kind of hard to use. It can be kind of difficult to, to look at the outputs of it. But there's a savior for us here. And it's called ProfViz. So this is a package that takes the profile that R uses, and it builds these cool automatic HTML widgets that let you interactively explore your code. You can explore a script and see where Time is actually being taken up. So here's what it would look like. We've got just some, some code. doesn't really matter what it is. I don't, you don't need to know what it is. But you just know that you're having something called first profile, and you're wrapping it in the prof viz function. You're using the curly brackets uh, to capture all of the code that you actually want to profile. And then you can pass some additional arguments to prof viz, but you can change the height of the HTML widget that gets output at the end. So that's just what I'm doing there. So we can actually take a look at what the output looks like. So here, 
Okay, here's what the output is. So we have an interactive thing here where we can look at line by line in our code and look at both how much time it took for that line to run and the memory allocation and deallocation of that line. So this can tell us a lot. Can you figure it out? Uh, let's see. I, okay, let me see. I don't think with this one I've been able to get it to work. That's better? Okay, cool. So you can see um, our, our profile here, right? So we can look at like, you know, this line is certainly the one of the more costly lines we have. Um, we can look at the whole thing. And so this allows you to really figure out, you know, what chunk of your code is taking a long time. So you might have, in that first scenario, run your code through this first. And you might have discovered that those for loops that you thought were really costly actually weren't the bottleneck in your code. And you might be able to now make better decisions about, like, what do I actually go after, right? So it might be that the things that are the bottlenecks, just there's nothing you can do about them. And then, hey, you're not wasting your time. You just know, all right, it's probably going to run a half hour. Um, what you also see here is pretty cool. So this is sort of a visualization of these different lines and the entire call stack of these different functions. So we have here the base thing being called is as data frame. But then within that, there are some different functions that are being called. We see matrix gets called there, our norm gets called there. What we see is we can build up the call stack from there, right? And it'll tell you all this different information about it. So I won't dig in too much into like what this is actually telling you. Uh, you can read up more on this, but I really just think this is a, a super valuable tool for like getting an idea of how you want to even implement any uh, optimization in the future. So, and also as this has a layout that is not quite as um, visually um, oriented, but you can actually break it down and look sort of down the call stack for any of these um, functions, and you can look sort of down the rabbit hole and see how each each thing is taking up time. Is this what you've been showing us, like built from that package? Like you didn't do anything additional? Nope, didn't do anything. This is, so cool. yeah, it's really cool. So if you get the R, R if you just use R prof, it, it'll it build something like this, but it's just like a text output. But the prof viz builds this automatically. It's really slick. And it'll build the HTML widget. Um, you can then save that. You can save it as an HTML file. So I just embedded it in the talk here. Um, in this slide, it's really easy. It's a cool way to like show people what's going on. I think it's just a cool. I think it's a cool visualization tool beyond just looking at how fast your code runs, but you get to see like what your calls are actually doing. It's a cool way to visualize like what a call stack is, and it kind of shows you some of the. It, I think it's helpful in anytime you're trying to dig maybe into the underlying complexity, like what's going on under the hood in R. It can be a cool tool for that too. So yeah, it's it's pretty slick and. Nicely, um, you can actually do it as an RStudio built-in. So I had a GIF here of me, a, a screen share of me doing it. But since it actually worked to get my dongle working to do this, we're just going to do it right in here. Okay. So this is a pack, or this is a script I have that does an integral projection model of based on some data. It's from Sebastian Schreiber. He he wrote this. So this is not my code, but uh, we we're talking about it in a lab meeting, and I thought it'd be good code to try this out with. So we see the code here. So I can just command A, select everything. And then in our studio, we just go up to profile, profile selected lines. It'll run this, run everything. It might take, it actually might take longer than I would like. But basically, then it'll just pop out one of those HTML widgets. And then you can explore it, and it'll look just like the one we looked at before. So I think it's pretty slick. Uh, you can do it on selected lines. You don't need to do it for a full script. Um, you can sort of break it down little chunk by chunk if you want to compare something. Um, I think it's a pretty sweet tool, and it's cool that they've got it built in. I've been using it a lot more recently since I found out it was a built-in tool in our studio. So, yeah. So when it's built in, that just means you don't have to wrap it, like literally typing and doing the curly braces, just kind of highlighting and stuff. Yep, like, exactly. Still be explicit in yep, exactly, yeah. So you can run, you can wrap it, wrap prof viz around whatever you want to do, and then That'll run, you know, that little chunk, or you can use this where you just highlight and just do profile, and then profile selected lines. So you can do whichever option you like. Um, I think it's it's pretty slick in our studio because it just pops up as a little like another tab with the HTML widget, and then you can save that. 
and you can you know rename it. You can save it as, as an HTML file. So here we go. I'll say profile one. And it's a massive script. So what it outputs is a little uh, hard to parse. One thing you can do is double click on a function down at the bottom, and it'll, it'll zoom in on that. And then if you double click on the background, it'll zoom back out. So it's really nice in that regard. You can also, um, I believe, just scroll. I'm just scrolling up and then scrolling down, and that'll zoom as well. Um, and then you can, you know, as you click on lines, it should highlight them where they're showing up. But yeah, it's pretty slick. And I think it's something definitely worth playing around with a little more. Um, there's a lot of cool stuff you can get out of it. And I think it just it tells you a lot, right? It gives you a lot of information you didn't have beforehand. So something I appreciate. Um, oh, are you serious? <laughs> Great. All right. Well, we're going to have to open the talk again, because for some reason it closed. This is the right one. Sorry about that. Oh, the joys of putting together HTML what, slides. Uh, slide presentation app did you use? Just using IO slides from our markdown. Yeah, it was the simplest one. It got kind of frustrating at times because mm -hmm. with IO slides, you have a little less control over some stuff. But um, for just putting stuff together, it was it was nice to have that. So um, yeah, all right. So we got to here. Made it past this point. Told you about the puns. All right, so past our studio built in. OK, so you might be interested in looking at some finer scale timing as well. You might want to compare things at a finer level. Um, one thing to know, I mean, that we, I think, all know is that R is what's going on behind the scenes is stochastic, right? It's not like everything is not going to take the same amount of time every single time. There's some variability there. So our, uh, the prof viz will just run everything once. So you're only going to get one um, uh, one run of that. But you might be interested in like I want to compare these two functions, and I want to see like really what's going on with them uh, across you know running them multiple times. So this is a cool package called MicroBenchmark. So it's a great package, and MicroBenchmark is the function within it as well that we'll use. It'll run many times since the results are stochastic, and the output is just a nice little distribution. It'll or tell you about the distribution of, of timing. So here's an example. We're going to import some uh, NBA stats data that I have in my computer. We're going to do a MicroBenchmark, and you can just see we do the different functions. They're just separated by commas. Um, you can actually run multiple lines as well, and you just separate those with curly brackets as well. So we're going to compare um, these three different methods of reading in a CSV. And the output looks like this. So we have our, the three different pieces of code we're comparing. And then we have the minimum, the lower quartile, the mean, medium, upper quartile, the max, and then the number of evaluations. So any val is um, going to be. 100 by default, you can change that. If you're running things that take a little bit longer and you're like, I don't want each of these to run 100 times, you can change that. Um, but I think it's pretty slick, right? We can see that the, the mean output time, or the mean time to read for each of these is pretty different, right? We, we all know that uh, read.csv is a little slower than tidy versus read underscore CSV. But uh, interestingly, look at this import function. Um, much faster than either of them. So. The microbenchmark is a really cool tool, which I'll use a bunch in the rest of the talk. But uh, these results will bring me into getting a pash IO net about speed. So the previous results show import speeds can vary a lot. So input output, also known as IO, uh, can be a bottleneck sometimes, right? If you're working with large data sets, that can especially be tricky. I don't know if you've had something where you read in a CSV and it, it takes forever. Um, so I like the Rio package. Uh, so this is a package that basically what it does is it takes uh, the two, there are two main uh, functions in it, import and export. And they automatically detect file extension. So if you say import and then just your, whatever you have has a .csv at the end, it'll know that's .csv. And then it'll actually pick, um, oops, it'll actually pick from a bunch of different uh, functions that it knows and pick the fastest one for that file extension. What's actually going on back here 
is import is calling the fread function from data.table, which is super fast. So um, you can look up on the Rio package documentation which functions it's using for any given file extension, but it's really slick. I think it makes your code really clean, easy to read. You might not have, have, have as much control over like some of the parsing like you do in a read underscore CSV, it'll tell you like, okay, this column got parsed as character, this column got parsed as double, whatever that might be. This one doesn't tell you quite as much, but I think it's pretty slick if you're interested in getting quick import and export. Yeah? Does this work across like all sorts of data or just more standard things? For instance, CSVs and like shapefiles and that sort of thing, or is it? I don't know about shapefiles. Let's look up. Um, uh, da, da, da. Let's look it up. There's with the package Rio. Let's see. I know one of one of these. If you look it up, they've got somewhere where they they describe which um, which file types are supported. Here, I think this. I believe this will tell you which different kinds here. So I don't know if it. If they have something for shape files, um, looks like no. yeah, it looks like they don't. Well, you have a lot of other stuff. Do you have a lot of other stuff? Um, yeah, which I think is pretty cool. Which also then, so you can, I, I'd, I'd recommend looking up some of the documentation for this, maybe. But uh, yeah, you can read a lot of different types of of data in, um, which I think is pretty pretty slick and you don't have to change anything. You don't have to pass any additional arguments to import. It'll just, it'll know. And you've already got that information of the file type in your file path anyways, right? It's going to have a .csv at the end, so you just look at it and know, okay, it's going to read in a CSV. So I think it reduces some of the clutter there. So um, another thing I think that I think is worth considering is I personally have always used CSVs, um, but I think it's sort of in the course of learning about the Rio package. Uh, I was introduced to this, to some different file types. Um, and the idea behind a CSV is it's nice because you can also use you know, Excel to look at it if you're sending it to a collaborator and they're not going to be doing anything in R and they want to actually look at the data. It's nice to save things in a CSV. But if you're going to be working within a computing environment, like if you have read in your CSV from your raw data, done some stuff to it, then you need to save an intermediate, and you're going to be working with that, or you're sending it to a collaborator who is going to bring, you know, will be bringing it into R. I'd consider you, you can consider some other file formats. So one in particular that I think is pretty cool is uh, .feather. So from what I understand, this was made by R and Python people as something that could be easily used across both platforms. And it's a compressed file format, like kind of like RDS or RDA. Um, so we'll compare write, dot, or write underscore CSV to write underscore feather. Um, so we're going to compare the two, and we're going to see which one looks faster using micro benchmark. And our data here are just a bunch of random numbers, so it's kind of meaningless. But So we can see the median time taken is significantly lower for dot feather. So it, they write faster because uh, there's some compression going on. Um, you can't open up a .feather file like outside of R and, and look at it. But if you're going to be working mostly in R, you can save quite a bit of time on the uh, uh, writing of a .feather here. Um, you can also we'll look at reading it in. And here the gains are even, even greater. So we can see a pretty significant change in the speed of reading this in. And that's a tiny file, right? That was 10,000 random numbers. The change in speed between the functions between C or between the CSV and a, a dot feather file the like percent difference between them just grows as uh, these as you you're using more and more data so if you're using big data files and you're writing these gigantic CSVs this can be pretty significantly different uh, yeah do you get concerned about like a plain text file anybody anywhere if they have computer to the data and it's like whether it's from 1990 or mm -hmm. 20 years from now, mm -hmm. a text file can be read. Mm -hmm. Versus something like a dot feather, there's a chance that you can use that data. Is that a concern with this? I'm not really sure. I thought about that. I mean, I think I think anything 
really important, truth be told, I would probably say it in a .csv just to be like, like you said, you know, it's very, it's pretty certain. Uh, with, with a dot feather, I think I would do that for like intermediate steps in the process. Like if I need to save data, and I know I'm going to have to be reading it in and writing it out more frequently, I think I'd consider using dot feather. But it's not something I really, truthfully, have used a lot in my own work because it's something I kind of came across during the process of putting this talk together. But um, yeah, I think I think um, dot CSV is like you know your your safe baseline bet, and this is something that. Um, you know, this is microseconds to read this. And if you're using data in this this size, do you really care about those microseconds? But if you're working with something bigger, it may save you some significant time. Um, also, the the files are much smaller. So .feather is a little bigger than other compressed file formats like .rds, but it's still way smaller than a CSV. So if you're also concerned about memory, like you're using tons of, or sorry, not memory, but storage, if you're using a ton of storage space for your data, this might be a, a fairly nice way to reduce that load as well. All right, how to make your code fast. Uh, there are too many ways for me to go through, so I'm not gonna try to dig into the actual like philosophy behind efficient coding, right? So I've done some stuff with input-output, I kind of showed you some tools before, but I'm not going to give you a comprehensive overview of all of the different ways that you could speed up your actual like code where you're doing analysis or you're doing your, your work. But I'll touch on a couple topics that I think come up a lot. Um, again, there's smarter people than me who have written better things than me on basically all of these topics, and I, I link to many of those at the end. So it's just uh, if you're interested in really knowing what's going on, uh, reading on further. So I'd like to touch on poor misunderstood for loops. So I feel like for loops are like the first thing to get picked on whenever someone says, my code is running slow, and people say, use apply um, instead of for loops. That's bad. Um, I don't think that, and I've, what, from what I've read, they aren't always as bad as people say. They're often poorly written, but any code that's poorly written is going to be less efficient than well-written code. Um, and they're often poorly used, but I would argue that it's not their fault. And if you understand really what's going on in for loops, I think you can use them to your benefit and use them well. So let's think about what actually makes a loop slow. So here's kind of a, a dumb example, um, but I think it illustrates a point. All right, using that micro benchmark function again, which is pretty slick. Uh, what we're going to do is just do a for loop. We're just going to run through 10,000 iterations. We're going to add one to A, okay? So A is just going to be a number that grows, okay? And we're calling 10. We're just saying 10. Nothing's getting done with it. We're just saying to R, 10. Uh, now, here, we're going to do the exact same thing, but that just saying 10 to R, we're going to wrap in a bunch of parentheses, okay? So what actually ends up happening is the one where we didn't do anything with the 10, we just said, hey, 10, it takes 2.82 milliseconds on average. The one where we wrap the 10 in a bunch of parentheses takes over twice that long. That's silly, right? We're not doing anything with that number 10. All we're doing is saying it. We're wrapping it in a bunch of parentheses. So the thing that's happening here is that everything going on in R is a function call or it's an object you're working with. So 2 plus 3 is actually you're using a function called plus, and you're passing to it the arguments two and three, right? And R has to look up that plus. R has to go, okay, that's a function. I know what that is. Okay, here are the arguments to it. It's really fast, but it still has to do that. In fact, parentheses is itself a function. Using the parentheses uh, is a function, and because it's a function, R has to look it up and know that you're doing a function call. So, but, so by putting a ton of them in this, around this 10, R to look up all of those parentheses. And in this really stripped down example, that takes a lot of the time. So basically what's happening is lots of calls going on in a for loop will lead to way, way, way more calls in total, right? So because every time we call these you know, seven parentheses, we're doing that 10,000 times. So that's a ton of lookups that are completely unnecessary, right? But that time adds up over time. So the point is, when you're doing something in a for loop, 
anything you do inside is going to get called a bunch of times. And just the more syntax you have in there even, R has to look up all of that syntax. And that can add up to a lot of time over that many iterations. So I, that's dumb. We wouldn't just add parentheses for no reason. Um, but they're, they're often slow when they're written inefficiently. Another thing that really helps is memory preallocation. So basically, this is the idea of don't grow your vectors. Um, so R, every time you, oh, sorry, I'll, I'll get to that in a sec. Um, so one thing you want to also do is do as much as you can outside the loop. This is true for apply functions as well, anything you're doing there. If you can do something outside of it and not calculate it inside, do that, right? Like if you're using the standard deviation of an entire data set, don't calculate it every single time in your for loop. Calculate it once first and just use that value, right? Because then you're just using that value instead of recalculating it every time your for loop happens. And don't avoid loops just for the sake of avoiding them. If they make sense to you, I mean, part of the reason we use R uh, is because it's fairly easy to read. It's fairly easy to understand. If you can make a for loop and you know what's going on in it and it runs fast enough for you, great. Like, I would rather have it be readable than have you really grind your teeth trying to get a, a, a for loop out of there when it doesn't need to be. So the apply functions. I'm not going to get into them too much. There are many good tutorials on, on these, some good talks on them. Um, but there's some debate sort of in the R community. You can read some really like heated Stack Overflow articles on uh, whether the apply functions are anything more than syntactic sugar, as someone referred to them. Like, are they really doing that much different than a for loop, or do they just clean it up and make it look nice? Um, so they actually do contain loops. Like, all the, all the apply functions contain loops. They have to loop through something. But they avoid a lot of the overhead that we have when we write explicit for loops in R. And sometimes they get to the underlying faster C code underneath. And that's when those loops run really quick, and we can get code that's much faster. <coughs> Like truly vectorized code, like call means, right? You're doing the means of all your columns in a, in a matrix or in a data frame. Um, this, loops for, this loops through values in underlying C, Fortran code. Any of these base functions were written by much, much smarter people than most of us, I would say, at least in the world of programming. So they're very, very optimized, and they're going to run way quicker than any sort of loop or apply function. So all right. We're going to compare, remember how I said don't grow your vectors? We're going to compare an inefficient vector growing for loop to uh, vapply. So I don't know if people are super familiar with the apply family of functions, but vapply is one where you tell the apply function what kind of output you're expecting. So it knows, it's not trying to guess. It knows explicitly it's safer because if, if it, you get an unexpected result, it'll throw you back a warning or an error, which is good. And it, it's quicker because it knows, like, OK, I'm looking for numeric values coming out of whatever I'm doing. All right, so we have a stupid function uh, that basically you're just taking some value x, you're going along, and you're for looping through the length of x. And for every value in x, you're going to square it, and you're going to store it in a result. Right? This is, this is silly. We wouldn't actually do this because uh, squaring something in, squaring a vector in R is pretty easy. But it, here, what we're doing is we're creating a results vector that is just it's not it's it's empty. We're not saying what length it is. We're just saying results is an object. So if every time we go through a value of x and add our our answer to results, it's growing by one. It's like all right, you go through the first value of x, you square it, you put it in. Results is a vector of length one. The second value, now it has to grow to length two. So what we see here is comparing it to an apply function, it's really slow. It's horribly slow compared to applying uh, uh, squared across your vector. So that's not going to be a good idea. Anytime you're growing a vector like that, it's going to be real slow. However, you can uh, use more efficient for loops and just say, OK, I'm going to tell you what this vector is going to look like, right? We know we're going to go through something of length x. We can tell it, OK, it's going to, we want it to be numeric values. We're going to call it a double. We're going to know it's a vector. So results is already, it's just this empty vector of the proper length and the proper type. So your for loop doesn't have to guess. 
Now we're just doing that same thing, that silly for loop we're going through, we're squaring every value and we're putting them into our results. Now the difference is much, much smaller, right? We're on the order of a couple, a couple milliseconds difference here, right? So it still might be smarter to use vapply because if you're doing something longer and more tedious, this actually could end up being more time. But the point is for loops, when you write them smarter, can be useful, but you really need to be careful of some of the pitfalls like growing vectors. Any questions coming up on the, the vector growing thing? I've seen a couple, couple faces that look a little skeptical, maybe. Huh? Okay. Right, move on then. So, another big benefit to using uh, the apply functions is that a lot of packages that deal with parallel computing, which I'm not going to really get into a lot today, um, they include parallelized apply functions. So, basically, like if you have a multi core computer, uh, you can just plug in with your apply function. You can plug in a new apply function like MCL apply um, from the parallel package, and you can just plug it into your code, and it'll and it'll go. You can actually plug it in. Um, you can tell it how many cores to use. There you go. Now you process much faster. If you were a for loop, it'd be much more difficult to do this. So the apply functions are cool because they allow you to sort of use some of these more flexible. Um, and they're more flexible in terms of incorporating things like parallel computing into your workflow. So I'm not going to get into the parallel stuff, but just know that like that's another reason you might want to apply uh, use apply functions. But I always remember um, that silly thing where we applied, you know, like square value um, across our vector. We'll never beat like real vectorized base functions. Like the ex expo uh, exponent function is just fast in and of itself, right? You could take a vector of 10,000 values, say square it, and it'll take every value in there and square it. Just one call, it's the neatest way to do it, and as we can see, it's like way, way faster. So if you get anything out of this talk, it's use base functions to your, to your benefit. You will never write a, an apply or a for loop that is anything close to as fast as a base function. And I think we too often ignore the fact that there are some really, really well-written base functions that are made by, again, people who have more time to do these things than us. All right, here's another cool thing. So that debate is sort of a big one that gets had in the R community, and you can dig into that more on your own time. But here's something cool that I hadn't heard about until prior to coming together to this talk, which you may have noticed is a theme. I just, like, the more I dug into this stuff, the more I found some cool things. So the memoize package can cache answers to a function. So what that means is if you call the function with the same inputs, it'll remember the old answer, and it can just reference that answer and give it back to you basically instantaneously. So here we have a function that'll calculate the Fibonacci number for any, the, or the point in a Fibonacci sequence for any given value. It doesn't really matter what this function is. Um, but it takes a long time the higher the value you pass to it is. It can, it can take a long time real quick. So here we'll compare at fib of value 25 and fib of 30. And we can see it's pretty slow, right? It took uh, much longer. System time is similar to micro benchmark, but um, it'll just give you the one time. It's not going to run and loop through it many, many times and give you back that value. It's kind of the more base way of, of time, how long something takes. But we can see it's pretty slow. Now what we can do is we can memoize the function and look at how the speed changes. So all we do is take our previous function called fib, pass it to memoize, and we name it as a new function. So the first time you do something with that new function, it'll be just about as slow as before, right? So 2.5. 2.4, right? It's, it's about the same amount of time. Watch what happens if we call fibmem30 again. Basically nothing. It's saying, ah, I already know that. I know the answer to that. And it can pick it up, and it takes almost no time. So this can be really useful in a couple different applications. So I'll go through a few potential uses. Um, one is like if you're running a Shiny app, and you want to store results in case your user selects the same inputs again. So right, a Shiny app is going to be uh, taking inputs from your user, figuring stuff out on the fly. Maybe you're fitting a linear model to some subset of the data. 
And I don't know, whenever I use interactive apps like that, I do a lot of like going back and forth between things, right? I'll like do, okay, what does this subset look like? Okay, do another one. All right, back to the first. And each time it's recalculating whatever you're doing. But you can use Memoize to store, these, store those values it already knows, which is pretty slick. So it can be really quick in going back to things they've already done before. Another one might be you're applying a function over a data set where you expect many similar inputs. Like you might just be running through a data set where you're like, okay, I, I know that this function is going to get the same couple inputs maybe a number of times. Like there's a set number of combinations that you could encounter in your data. Maybe you have one column that's either zero or one, and then the other column is one or two, right? And it'll figure out those couple different combinations real quick, and then it doesn't need to calculate them anymore, right? It'll just say, I know the answers to these, and every single one past that point is going to be really, really fast. So in that case, you can get some crazy speed ups with your uh, analysis here. Another one might be, you're just working on a script, and you want to save the results of some really slow calls just as you're working, right? You're just kind of tweaking, you're working through stuff, and you're like, I just don't want this to have to run again. This is a little more similar to if you use our markdown, where you put in the chunk options, cache equals T, cache equals true, where it caches the results there. And so every time you're knitting that document, you're putting your R markdown document back together, it doesn't need to rerun that chunk and get the new results of it. So th that's a similar use, I would say. But if you're doing it outside of um, an R markdown document. Uh, one trade-off here to be aware of is speed versus memory. So right, it's storing all of these values in some cache. And if you do that over a huge data set where you're going to have a ton of different answers and you don't expect a lot of similar answers back, uh, this can eat up your memory pretty, pretty badly. Um, it has some cool options. There's some stuff in the um, metalized function that allows you to basically, you can have a timeout for your cache where it's like, okay, after some given time, if I haven't encountered these values, I'll get rid of them. Uh, there's a lot of cool stuff you can do there. You can actually cache across like Google Drives or Amazon uh, cloud services. So you can have your caches of potential answers actually stored across multiple platforms. Pretty neat. I didn't dig too much into that, but you can if you would like. One thing to be really, really careful of that I thought about with this is if you're doing any sort of randomization, this is very dangerous because you will get unexpected things back and it probably would be hard to catch. So don't do this if the function you're using has any sort of randomization in it. So here I made a dumb function that takes the R norm of some value and then just adds one to all of it, right? So I'm calling it very creatively R norm plus one. So what we're doing here is we're, we're calling it twice, and we're storing those values, right? And it's our norm. It's random normal, right? We would expect these two to be different. So we'll pass those two um, objects into all dot equal. So that'll tell us our x and y are the values in there equal to each other. What it gives us back is, no, they're not. The mean difference between the values of x and y is that it's pretty slick. All that equal is a pretty cool function. I would recommend using it. Um, so that means, no, they're not the same, which is what we'd expect, right? They're both random normal distributions plus one. Um, now, let's memoize that, fun that function. We'll do the same exact thing, but we'll call it with our memoized one. What do people, what do people think the answer is going to be here? All dot equal. Well, it's true. So x and y are exactly the same thing, because x goes, so the second time it's called, it goes, hey, I remember what you want when you do this function with 10, and it'll give you back the exact same thing. So you might think these two are random, right, and that x and y should be different, but they're not. So be really, really, really careful if there's any randomization going on in a function that you're calling, uh, you're not going to get random uh, outputs uh, if you memoize one of those functions. So this is a potential pitfall that could, like, really mess some stuff up if you try to apply this without really thinking through what you're doing. So just be careful of that. All right. We're going to dig into some kind of weird stuff here. Um, so R is an interpreted language, so it's not compiled into 
into byte code or machine code that your computer understands when it's run. There's something intermediate that interprets it. I'm not going to get too into the weeds here because I'm not a computer scientist, and I don't think I'm going to do this explanation justice. But I'm going to talk about what it maybe means to you. So R has a just-in-time compiler, which means it compiles your code into byte code that the computer understands just in time to be run. So the function. So if you're running R 3.3 or earlier, uh, the JIT compiler is not turned on by default. You can you can turn it on and you can mess with it as you like. Um, but in actually in R 3.4, one of the biggest changes they made was that the JIT compiler is turned on by default. Um, so I've been having some weird things on my computer with R3.4 lately, and so I wasn't able to dig into this too much. But uh, you can play with that as you like. But we're gonna, I'm going to be running everything on R3.3, and we'll be discussing it in that framework. So you pass a value to enable JIT from 0 to 3. 0 means the just-in-time compiler is turned off. 3 means it's going to compile every function it comes across. It's going to be like for loops. Yeah, we'll compile those. Everything, enclosures, all this cool stuff, we're going to compile those. 1 and 2 do something intermediate. And actually, in R3.4, the default value is 3, where it'll try to compile the most stuff it can. So that compilation step takes a little time. Um, but basically, then, after it compiles that function, that function will run much quicker after that point. So. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to compare the three, the highest level of just-in-time compilation to turned off. So we're going to use a boring function, and we're going to use it 100 times. So um, basically what we're doing here is we're comparing the just-in-time compiler off for a function that we use a lot, right? So it gets compiled the first time, and then the compiled version runs the other 99 times. And you can see it's faster, right? So after it compiles that function once, it can just call that compiled function, and it's like, yeah, we have this fast version, okay? So we can see three is a mean of 16 milliseconds, and with it off, it's a mean of about 63 milliseconds. Um, however, uh, we're going to do the same comparison, but we're just going to use in this comparison, we're using the function once. So each time. This function is only going to get used one time, right? So we're compiling it, and then we're using it once. And what we see is JIT 3 is much slower than with it turned off. So what this is telling us is that compiling a function into bytecode that, that your computer understands is really quick if you need to use that function a lot. But if you, if you create a function and then you only use it once, that compilation brings overhead into the equation, right? It takes some time to compile, and then it's like, well, that, that speed is negated by the fact that you took time to compile it. So it can bring some overhead costs, um, which is something to be aware of, right? Um, so the JIT compiler is turned to 3 by default in R3.4, and like I just showed, sometimes it can be slower. So this might be something to experiment with, turning it on, turning it off. Actually, that same uh, integral projection model script I ran before, uh, I ran a number of times um, using the two values with it turned off or with it turned on to three. And it was actually significantly faster with the enable JIT value on. So I know this is kind of small, but this is enable JIT zero, enable JIT three. This is the number of seconds it took. So on average, it took like just under 41 seconds with the JIT compiler turned off, and it took about 44 seconds with it turned on. I haven't dug too much into why this happens, but also the implication here is this particular script would run slower in R3.4, potentially, than it would in R3.3. So this is something to be aware of. Truth be told, I haven't dug into this too much, into like why this particular script ran slower with the compiler turned on, but it's something to be aware of. Um, let me see. You can also compile individual functions with comp fun. So it's kind of similar to that memoize where we just pass in uh, a function and then we have a compiled function. So what we can see here is, again, looking at time, we're comparing regular old loop square, that dumb squared function I did, and then a pre-compiled version. And we can see it runs significantly faster uh, with the compilation just on that single function. Um, we can also look at it if we're taking the compilation time into consideration. So in this case, what I'm saying is compile the function, run the function. 
compare that to just the function itself and compare it to pre-compiled. What you see is it's actually it's still faster than the non-compiled version, even when you take that compilation step into account. So this is a cool way to sort of test at an individual level how much faster it is to compile or not. So this is sort of something to do if Maybe you want to turn that JIT compiler off altogether, and you only want to compile certain functions one at a time. Now, that may be like too much time. That might be more time than you want to spend doing this sort of stuff. So um, yeah, let's see. So yep, in this case, it's still faster if you include the compilation step. So some functions definitely benefit more than others. There are certain functions that if you're calling lots of R functions in them, compiling might not do you a lot of good. Um, and like I said, mileage may also vary with R3.4, so um, just be aware of that. All right, we're going to get into some stuff I'm just going to touch on briefly. So you may, at the end of the day, just say, well, it's my computer's fault. And, you know, it, sometimes it's an excuse, sometimes it is true. Uh, we don't all have access to, you know, giant, big, big fast computers in our labs. Um, you can use some benchmarking scripts to see how fast your computer is and compare them to others. So. This is, uh, there's some kind of standard R benchmarking scripts to see, you see how long it takes them to run, and it'll kind of tell you, well, how, how fast is your machine, how fast is your R. Um, there's also the benchmark me package. Um, there's a function that you can use to run through a series of these automatically, and it'll tell you how fast yours is. And I think you can even compare it to other people who have, who have done this. Uh, there's like a GitHub uh, page where you can look at that. Um, you might consider using virtual machines through Google or Amazon. So I know Noam, in one of his uh, talks at, at the uh, our users group on, um, I think it was bigger, faster, stronger, um, he talked about this. And you can pretty cheaply these days run virtual machines either through Google Compute Engine or through the Amazon Web Services, where you can get access to something a lot bigger than what you have. I would also say don't sell the farm. So we, uh, if you're in the College of Ag, like Ag and Biological Sciences, you have access to the farm cluster. Um, there's some good documentation on that. I know Bill Broadley, who runs the cluster, has given some talks in here, and they're really cool. So com uh, cluster computing is something to certainly look into as well. Again, not going to get in into that too much. Just want to sort of introduce a couple ideas you can do here. And you know, buy, buy more RAM if you can upgrade that on your computer. That might be worth, worth the uh, not throwing coffee at your wall. Um, another thing to think about, this is kind of in, in deep into the weeds, but uh, um, BLAST is a basic uh, linear algebra subprogram. So this is what your computer uses to do uh, matrix and linear algebra. Um, R uses a pretty universal solid one that just, it works, it gets the right answers, people agree on it, um, but it's certainly not optimized to your computer. Um, so others are optimized for certain computers. And sometimes your computer comes with them. You can download open BLAST programs. Like This is sort of a very under the hood kind of thing. But if you're doing some sort of work that includes a lot of linear algebra, a lot of working with matrices, this could be worth it. Um, so you can figure out what BLAST library you're, library you're using with this function. So this is from the benchmark me package I just talked about, get underscore linear underscore algebra. Um, it's pretty slick. It'll tell you where on your computer uh, R is looking for those linear algebra subroutines. Um, you can look up different articles on how to change these. Um, here's a one if you uh, want to look later on how to change yours on a Mac. So I, I, um, Apple includes sort of a different one that's optimized for their machines, and it can really speed up linear algebra operations if you change it over. OK, so I'm going to sort of, we're going to close things out, run through sort of the breakdown of like how to approach optimization of your code. So I would say first thing I think is worth doing is looking at some of the one-time low-hanging fruit. Like it may take you a half an hour, an hour to figure out how to change your blasts on your computer. But once you do that, you never need to do it again, and things will just run faster, right? You may decide hmm, I think I'm going to start using the import function from Rio from now on, right? And then that doesn't take that much thought. You just do it, and things are faster, right? So there's some low-hanging fruit that I think you can just change, and it's not going to take a lot of effort. It's not going to change the way you, like, fundamentally think about doing your programming. But there's sort of the low-hanging fruit that you can pick off and get some benefits from pretty easily. 
Next thing is profile your code. Remember, identify your targets and identify some speed goals, right? Are you really like really dead set on cutting your <coughs> speed down to this much time? Like when do you say, okay, my script is fast enough. I'm okay with it running for 20 minutes instead of 30, right? You're not like, I need to get it to five, right? So identify how, how quick you're really trying to move. Um, decide which targets are worth the work or learning to fix. You may see that in the prof viz, one thing is like, I cannot possibly figure out how to fix that. But one thing might be a little easier, right? So identify targets too that you think are worth you taking the time to fix. Test some alternatives, right? Using the benchmarking or profiling, that micro benchmark package I think is super cool to, for trying out like, hmm, I wonder if this thing would run faster. Give it a shot, see if it does. Keep your old versions for future reference. I think this is always a smart idea for any time you're trying to make your code better. Keep an old version so you can go, ah, yeah, you know, I didn't really uh, do this well last time. But you can always remember that. You can learn what you did differently. I think that's important. For goodness sake, please use base functions, right? None of us, I don't think any of us here are better programmers than the R core team. And uh, they're pretty darn good at making sure that base functions in R run really, really fast. So use them when ever, ever you possibly can. So remember, like this is sort of really strategic, right? I'm going to identify targets and we're going to go after them really strategically. But that's good. But no one's perfect. And honestly, I think experimentation and playing around can be an important part of learning, right? I, I didn't figure any of these things out without just like goofing around in R, which I think is something that um, we we try, obviously we're all busy, and most of us use R as a tool to get some other work done. But I think goofing around and like letting yourself explore a little bit is a really important way of getting better, encountering mistakes, fixing them, figuring stuff out. You're not going to learn as much if you just decide, like, I'm going to be absolutely rigidly disciplined at all times. So don't be afraid to goof around a little bit. Some things to keep in mind anytime you're working on an optimization project. How much are you going to use this code, right? Is this going to be something you're going to use for the rest of your dissertation? Are these going to be items of this that you potentially be, will use forever? Um, or is this going to be something you're going to never touch after tomorrow? How about as a learning curve, right? Like I said before, uh, is the thing you want to fix just like way out of your depth? How long is it going to take you to figure it out? Is it even worth it? How much time do you have as a researcher, right? Like I said, if you are crunched for time, maybe don't take that opportunity to goof around an R. And at the end of the day, R is, we don't use R because it's extremely blazing fast, right? We use R because it's flexible, because it's super broad, because maybe it's what we learned. But if you are really, really trying to like eat every last little bit of speed out of R and you're really diving down and getting really into it, it's sort of like trying to build the world's fastest monster truck. Like, cool, but uh, that's not really what it's for. So just remember, like, Picking up microseconds is not necessarily what we're shooting for in R. So if you're crunched for time, learning a new method will take a while, and you're never going to use this script again, why bother? But I think there are a lot of times where this doesn't fit, and we can optimize our code, learn something in the process, and make things faster for us in the future. So got to give credit where it's due. So these are some good resources, among many others. Um, Efficient R Programming by Colin Gillespie. So this is an online book like published on GitHub. Um, incredibly good book. Really well written. Huge range of topics ranging sort of the full breadth of what I covered and even more. Um, I think this is sort of what got me interested in this sort of idea. Talks about efficiency basically from the computer all the way through learning and collaborating. Really great resource. Cannot recommend enough. I used uh, Noam Ross's uh, talk from 2013 and his blog post on vectorization. Um, really useful stuff. He's an incredibly smart guy and very, very good at communicating a lot of these ideas, better than me, many of them. Uh, Hadley Wickham's Advanced R book, uh, particularly the performance and profiling chapters. So this is a fantastic book for digging down into any sort of stuff like this a little more. Um, a cool article on for loops from this R newsletter from like the core team in 2008 where they, they actually have an example where a loop works fine, but apply runs out of memory and crashes. Um, so very interesting to read stuff from them and very well written. Um, and finally, oh, not finally, lots of stack overflow. So you can dig into the apply versus for loop debate here. 
And then this book, I don't know if any of you have heard of this book, Our Inferno by Patrick Burns. He literally discusses R as a, a series of circles of hell and descending through them. Uh, I would say like, if you really wanna like make your brain hurt with R, uh, dig into this book, but it actually has some really, really interesting stuff on pitfalls and common pitfalls in R. So with that, um, thank you all for coming and listening to me babble way up here. Um, any, I'll take any questions, otherwise I think time for a little work session, so. Cool. Thank you. All right, and then.